Let's get started. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to a really exciting morning of chemistry, Chem 1211, with your host, me, Dr. White. And we're going to have an exciting morning. Let me give you a heads up on what we're doing today. First of all, I'm going to go through the problem set answers for chapter three. There are two sets. One is temperature I put separate. And then we'll do the lab. And then we'll do something exciting, an experiment we're going to do. I'm going to be using breakout rooms. And you're going to have a chance in small groups to meet your colleagues. One of the disadvantages of teaching online is I don't get a chance to really meet most of you. And you don't get a chance to meet a lot of your colleagues. And we'll, over the next couple of weeks, we'll be working on that. And hopefully you'll enjoy it. You will enjoy it. No. So let's get started. All right, everybody see? Well, let me move up to the top. Hang in there. All right, everybody see chapter three problem set? Thumbs up, people. Thank you. All right, let's go through this. Now, you should try this on your own, hopefully, if you want to do good on test number one, which is coming up this Wednesday. Yes, we will have class on Monday. Other schools don't, but COD does. So please show up because I'll go through practice uh, chapter for practice problems, and I'll do my world re famous review for the next test. All right, but let's look at chapter three. First of all, one, what is one of the four main branches of chemistry? And you only have to name one. The best is organic, but I'm an organic chemist, and there's an organic physical analytical. Now, what's matter? Anything that occupies space and has mass. Oh, it's time for everybody to do group participation, you don't have to turn on your mic, but what are the three states of matter? And they are solid, liquid, gas. Again, three states of matter, solid, liquid, gas. And you should know solid has definite shape and definite volume. I see a question or Ah, someone got it right. Uh, hopefully all did. Solid has definite shape, definite volume. Liquid has definite volume, but indefinite shape. And a gas has indefinite shape, indefinite volume. I'm going to go through a lot of this. If you have questions along the way, always feel free to ask. Because by now, I think you've learned in my class, in my world, there's no such thing as a dumb question. All questions are good questions, and I'll answer them with respect. <clears throat> Excuse me. And now, number four, name a pure substance. When we talk about matter, there's two classifications, pure substances or substances and mixtures. And example of pure substance would be water, gold, the oxygen you're breathing, not the air, the oxygen. And the list goes on and on and on. Now, name a mixture that you could purchase at the grocery, your local grocery store. Well, milk, mouthwash. By the way, pop that stuff in, the car, in a can or bottle that's carbonated and non-alcoholic. Dr. White's from the Chicagoland area. We don't call that soda. And mustard, ketchup are all mixtures. Now, not at your grocery store, but I don't know if you thought about it. Gasoline is a very complex mixture. Now, when we have two different types of mixtures, one is homogeneous, 
and that's the same throughout and heterogeneous, it's not the same throughout. And I ask, is the oil vinaigrette dressing a homogeneous or heterogeneous mixture? I make my own, but when I was young, my mother loved wishbone oil vinaigrette or Italian dressing. And if you shook up the bottle, you put it on your salad and you put the bottle down. And what happened after a while? Oh, two layers. And that's because after it's, it's a heterogeneous mixture. Now, the answer to that oil vinaigrette, heterogeneous. Now, gasoline, I already told you, is a homogeneous, it better be. All right. Now, commercial from Dr. White, or no, public service announcement from Dr. White. Hopefully, you've all learned the periodic table. Only the 37 I asked you to learn, not all of them. And you know both the name and symbol. It was on test one, two, three, four and the final, final is in five, and the final, I guess I can go like, that. Nah, it doesn't look like the letter F. But anyways, on the final, you should be using the green periodic table I've shown you. It'll be a download that will be in the assignment area when we do test one or you do test one. And you should know those. And I can ask on a test, one or two points each. Give the chemical symbol for carbon. Oh, my favorite, C, chlorine, Cl, silver, Ag, gold, Au, and so on. By the way, sodium, why is it Na? Because that's Latin for the Latin name for sodium. I believe it's natrium. How they got that, I don't know. But anyways, that's how sodium got Na. Now, I could also ask on a test, give the name of the element one or two points each for the following chemical symbol. So Na, sodium, got ahead of myself. Oh, Br, bromine, I work with bromine. Gas, which is really Br2, but the element bromine is Br, C is carbon, and magnesium, Mg. And I work with argon, Ar, and unless I have been stole, kidnapped to another universe, in our universe, Krypton, KR, is a colorless gas. It's not a green solid that kills Superman. All right, next, let's talk about chemical and physical properties. A physical property is something you observe without changing the nature of what you're observing. A chemical property is something that shows how it has the ability to change into something new. Examples, let's look at the problem set. Water freezes at zero degrees C. Is that a chemical or physical property? And the answer is physical property because when it does freeze, it still stays, it's still water. It doesn't change. Now, iron can rust. Now, this might be a little difficult unless you realize rust, which is called ferric oxide, Fe2O3, is different from pure iron. And the fact that it can rust shows its propensity, ooh, fancy word today, to change its chemical nature. And therefore, that's a chemical property. Don't try this at home, but gasoline is flammable. And that tells you its ability to change into something else. When you burn gasoline, please don't ever try this, you form something new. And that's carbon dioxide and water. Which reminds me, have you ever been driving around cold weather like we're having in the next couple of days? It's supposed to get brutally cold. And you're at a stop sign or a stoplight, and you see the car in front of you and see the tailpipe, and you see water coming, not why well, I gave it away, see a liquid coming out of the tailpipe. And you think, oh no, it's leaking gasoline. No, that's water. What happens is in real cold weather, 
when you start out your tailpipe muffler and catalytic, <clears throat> excuse me, catalytic converter are still very cold. And they do, are you ready for this? I snuck it in, a physical change. The water coming out of your car engine after combustion is a gas. And normally at most temperatures, it comes out of your tailpipe as a gas, which you don't see. We call that water vapor. That's another way of saying water as a gas in the air. But when it's super cold, all that parts of your engine are cold, and that condenses, turns the water from a gas to a liquid, and that's what you're seeing coming out of the tailpipe, not gasoline. I was in a car one time with a friend, and friend said, oh, that car is going to explode. What do you mean? There's gas coming out of it. No, no, and I had to teach some chemistry to my friend. All right, now let's talk about physical changes. That's when something actually changes its physical state, but not its chemical nature, what it is. And if you have water boiling, that's a physical change because the water, when it boils, becomes a gas, but still H2O. And when you have ice cubes or ice melting, it's still water as ice and it's still water as a liquid. Oh, I'm going to make you work this morning. Any of you, can any of you think of a physical change in your daily life? Open up the chat, see if anybody wants to come out with an example. Oh, come on, at least one person. What would be an example of a physical change? Uh-oh, this is a Friday. I don't feel like answering anything, Lab. Okay, that's allowed. Dr. White will do it for you. Anybody know of an example of physical change? I do. When you take a hot shower or bath, you have what water vapor coming into the air, lots of it, unless you have a good uh, exhaust fan like I do in my bathrooms. I actually have two good two bathrooms in my home. And but if you don't, what do you see on the mirror? This is in the winter, or if you have a window in your bathroom, I have a skylight, I don't have a, a window. But anyways, on the mirror, you'll see it fog up. And what is that? That's the water that's in a gas phase going on your mirror as a liquid phase. And that's a physical change. Now, give an example of a chemical change. This is when something, uh, I see a question or observation. I guess snowflakes, uh, Kelly, when they hit the ground and melt, that would be a physical change. Um, I guess when they're formed, I don't know how they're formed, I guess from the clouds. So when snowflakes are formed, that would be a physical change. Because if you think about it, and don't quote me on this because I might be wrong, but I doubt it. Uh, snowflakes are this water in a solid phase. That's what snow is. It's just they're very pretty. All right, let's take a oops. let's take a look at give an example of a chemical change. Well, iron rusting is one. When you burn a candle, the wax is burning and it becomes carbon dioxide and water, again, combustion. And that's an example of a chemical change. Now, when I was young, like about two and a half, three, my mother told me, chew your food before you swallow it or you'll choke. Because I used to wolf down things, if you know what that expression means. And guess what? She was right. I did one time. Oh, Relax, I survived, in case you were wondering. But when you chew your food well, like my mother told me, and she was not lying to me, 
and you swallow it, it goes into your stomach down here. And guess what? It undergoes chemical changes. In case you don't realize it, you're a walking chemical plant. Throughout your whole body, chemical changes are occurring, but some of the most important ones are in your stomach. And uh, so next time you eat food or with a friend and you want to ruin their lunch, dinner, or breakfast, tell them, you know, the food you just swallowed is going to your stomach and small intestine undergoing a chemical change. Don't do that. You lose friends real quick. All right. I guess you could do it virtually and they just bounce you out of Zoom. All right, let's look at what state of matter has definite shape, definite volume. <clears throat> and the answer is a solid. Like I said earlier, you should know the three states of matter and their definition. I don't do compressibility. I've never found that useful. All right, what state of matter has indefinite shape and definite volume? And that's the gas. And finally, what state of matter has indefinite shape and definite volume? And that's a liquid. And now let's move on to the next problem set. Still chapter three. but the steels, I put, put a separate one for temperature. Now, everybody see my whiteboard there? Thank you. All right, now, there are three formulas you should know how to use. One is degrees F equals 1.8 times degrees C Celsius plus 32. Next one is degrees C equals degrees F minus 32 divided by 1.8. And the last one is Kelvin equals degrees C plus 273. Now let's, each of these in the past, I had students memorize them, but good news, you don't have to. You just have to know how to use them because these will be on the last page of the test that I'll be sending out next Wednesday. It'll be an important information. And I no longer am testing your memory for formulas like this, but do you know how to use them? And let's look at these. For the going from Celsius to Fahrenheit, 1.8 and 32 are exact numbers. And what that means is whatever, however many significant figures your degree C is, is how many significant figures your answer should be. And you should do the multiplication before you do the addition. I'll say that again. You should do this multiplication before you do this addition. Now, in this one right here, 32, because it's part of a definition, and 1.8 are exact numbers. And the only thing that determines how many significant figures your final answer has is the value you're given for degrees F. Now, listen closely. Common mistake, students divide degrees F by 1.8, 32 by 1.8, and subtract, and you get the wrong answer. You have to do what's in the bracket first. See, it even says it on the screen. Oh, that was awful joke. <laughs> it's getting awful for humor Friday, but seriously. Do what's in the bracket first and then divide. Do the subtraction and then do the division. And you'll get the right answer. I should point out on test one and two and three and four in the final, underneath where you put your name, it will say 
please use proper significant figures for all calculated answers. And if you do the wrong, uh, do the right answer, but it has too many significant figures, I'll take off a point. And if there are four or five calculations and you lose four or five points, that's not going to help your grade. So make sure you know how to do significant figures for addition and multiplication division. We went through that already. Now the last one is Calvin. And it's not degrees Calvin, because Calvin is an absolute, which means you can't go below zero. And that's degrees C plus 273. Since this is also an exact number, and you're doing an addition, you have the same number of significant figures to the right of the decimal point in degree C measurement as you would have in your answer. I'll say that again. Because this is an addition, you have the same number of degrees of significant figures to the right of degree C that will be in your answer, like any addition, except this does not play a role in figuring out significant figures past the decimal. So let's take a look at these. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention yesterday, but I'll mention it now. Some instructors do the stupid thing, which Dr. White never does on a test or in real life. If you have a thermometer reading a certain degrees F, what's it in Kelvin? Well, first you got to convert it to C, degree C, then use the third formula. That's not real life, and that's why Dr. White doesn't do that. All right, let's go to the problem set. Now, one of the things you'll see throughout the semester that I don't know when I developed it, but it helped me take tests and do well on tests. By the time I got my PhD degree, I did a lot of hard tests in chemistry and also math and other things in undergrad. And I found that when I have a problem like this, First of all, after reading it, I write down a question mark and what units am I being asked to find? What am I being asked to find? Then underneath that, I give whatever numbers I'm given plus their units. So if we look at number one, you'll see, and I haven't checked, but everybody see the temperature uh, problem set on the screen? Thumbs up, thank you. If a temperature of a liquid is 134 degrees C, what's the temperature of the liquid in degrees F? And if you notice over here, I have question mark degrees F that tells me that's what I'm trying to find. I have this, and therefore I'm trying to convert from degrees C, Cal, to Fahrenheit. And how do I do that? I use this formula. And another thing I learned was the more I let the paper do the thinking, the higher my scores were on test. How does paper think? Well, put down everything on paper. Don't try and carry it in your head. And notice I put down the formula. And then now, what's degrees C? Oh, I took the time to figure that out. I can pop it in. And now I'll do my multiplication first, then addition. These are exact numbers. This is three significant figures. My answer should be three significant figures. And the same thing with number two. Now let's look at number three. If your oven is 353.5, you got a really good digital oven temperature readout. Mine only goes to three significant figures, not four, like this. But you have 353.5 Fahrenheit. What's the temperature of your oven degrees C? Well, what are you trying to find? Degrees C. What are you given this? And since I'm going from Fahrenheit to Celsius, I know I use this formula. And if I put in degrees F, I'll do the subtraction first, then the division. Notice this is four significant figures. And lo and behold, my answer is four significant. If you put 179, rounded it off to three, I'd take off a point. I'd still give you credit, 
But if that were a three or four point question, you lose a point, which is not good on any test. And let's go to number five. And number five is the temperature of gas is 303 degrees C. What's the temperature of the gas in Kelvin? And therefore, what are we being asked to find? And again, I use the question mark to help me identify or identify what am I trying to find Kelvin? And underneath, what am I given? This number. Therefore, I know to use this formula which you'll be given in the end of the, on uh, important information at the end of test number one, but you gotta know how to use it and when to use it. And this is the time. So I'm going from degrees C to Kelvin. I have my formula, put my number in, which I took the time to write over there, add it up. There's no uh, numbers past the decimal point. Therefore, this is the correct now, number. Now here, if we look at number six, I have if the temperature of liquid is 101.5 degrees C, then what's the temperature of liquid in Kelvin? Again, question mark Kelvin. That's what I'm trying to find. This is what I'm trying, to, what I'm given. I know Kelvin equals degrees C plus 273. And therefore, I'll put in this number, but wait, this is an addition 273 is an exact number. Notice when you do an addition of all the significant figures you're adding, the number with the fewest significant figures is the number of significant figures to the right of the decimal. And this has one. This is an exact number, so it doesn't play a role. So you need this 0.5 because it's the one significant figure to the right of the decimal. And that's chapter three problem set. Any questions? Uh-oh, I was just gonna do a massive, massive generation gap thing. Danny, what's the name of your puppy or dog again? If you don't mind me asking. Uh, Bruno. Who? Bruno. Bruno, tough name. Hi, Bruno. <laughs> <laughs> I won't even charge you extra for him being fast. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Any questions? Going once, going twice. By the way, dogs, children, and everybody else is allowed walking behind you and all that. Uh, last semester and this semester even, I've had people with their dogs, their cats, their children, their mother's walking behind the screen. And I'll wave and say hello to them. They get freaked out when I do that. Not really. All right. Since there's no questions, let me remind you first. Don't forget. Oh, I do have Bernice. Thank you for your question. And yes, test number one will cover chapters one through four, not the stuff we've done since then on nine. That will not be on test number one. And let's do something real quick. I'm going to Blackboard, hang in there. All right, does so everybody see on Wednesday on your screen and other things? Thank you. I try all, well, I don't try, I always do 
Uh, usually about a week before a test, I'll post this like I did here. This was sent out as an email to you. Hopefully you're checking your student email, you should. And it's on here an important information announcement. And notice right here, underlined test one will cover chapters one through four. It has 11 pages. That includes an important information it has 27 problems and seven multiple choice out of those 27. The others are short answer. I also have a periodic table in the assignment area you can download and we'll still have our regular Zoom meeting on Wednesday. And by the way, we'll still have Mondays because COD does not take a holiday for President's Day. The other school I have does, but here we don't. And I'll always do this. Now, let me, I'll talk about it Monday again. I think I did it on Wednesday, but relax, take your time, take a deep breath. 27 problems. My test, and I've been teaching 12 11 enough times, and also 12 12, I've taught here enough times. I know how to write a test, and I teach by my golden rule of teaching, which means I don't do to my students what I didn't like done to me. And yes, I can remember when I was a student in a galaxy far, far away, long time ago. But anyways, I didn't like it, even though I usually could finish it, but I still didn't like it. When you have a test and you can barely finish it, the best person in the class, like in chemistry or math, could barely finish it and the rest of the class couldn't, that's not fair. So my tests are designed, even though you're taking it at home, and if you need a couple extra minutes, if we were face-to-face, -face, you'd have 50 minutes. And most of my students from my test get done in about 35, 40 minutes. That's assuming you've done the practice problems and studied a little. If you haven't, well, you could have all day and it won't help because you don't know what's going on. Hopefully you do because you've done the practice problems on your own. Any other questions before we start the lab? Going once, going twice. I used to go to auctions with my brother-in-law when he owned his own company, a bindery company, to buy equipment from companies that were selling equipment. And that was awesome because you'd see stuff being sold for fifty, a hundred thousand dollars for different pieces of equipment. The first time I went to an auction with him, he said, "Put your hands in your pockets to your pants and don't move or say anything, or you just bought something for fifty thousand dollars." It was still fun to go there, and you'd always hear the auctioneer going once, twice, third, three times sold to the person over there in the yellow shirt. No, I didn't mean to do it. That never happened. All right, it's lab time. Are you guys ready for a lab? And today's lab deals with heat. And heat is an important subject. They actually, there's a whole area of chemistry called thermodynamics. In fact, that was one of the hardest undergrad courses I took as a chem major. We called it thermo. And it was a whole semester and it was taught by the guy who wrote the book, and the book wasn't that good. I still remember his name, Professor Wood, but he was a good teacher, even though his book he wasn't a good author. And that was a bear of a class. But today, we're just dealing with a fun part of thermodynamics or heat. And that is when you go to a supermarket and you go to buy stuff you like, which unfortunately is stuff I really like, has a lot of calories. How do they know how much calories it is? Well, calories is a me measure of heat. It's also now a measure of how fattening something is. But anyways, how do you determine that? Well, you measure when most things, when you combust it, react it with oxygen, how much heat is given off. And from that measurement, when something is heated, the temperature changes and you can determine the calories. And you'll be doing that in today's lab, sort of, because we're not at COD. And the beyond lab Z, calorimeter lab is, nah. everybody know what that means? Eh. Not that good. <laughs> now you know that. 
Boy, I just did another generator. You guys don't know. Eh, no, no, it's not that good. I have to cut that out. But anyways, let's first of all look at the Beyond Lab Z Lab and give me a second while I log in. Actually, it's more than a second. If you go to the chemistry section and open it up, And go to calorimetry. You don't have to do this. And you all should see the calorimetry lab. Where is it? Well, you got to go to the stock room, take the calorimeter. There are different types. Let's get the fancy, expensive one. And you can take it and Come on, there you go. And you can put samples in here. And I tried it and they do it with sucrose and it sort of works, but it took me a while to figure it out. And I figured, you know, some, I'd rather have the students do it. By the way, this is called the bomb. No, it's not gonna explode, but that's where you put your samples in right here to, heat and combust. Well, today's lab, let me exit this. We're not gonna use Beyond Lab Z. And we'll do that a couple of times. We're gonna use it a number of times. So you'll get your money's worth, but not today. Now I do have in the syllabus where this is the PDF for Beyond Lab Z. You don't have to look at it, but if you're interested, here they do something different, and that is Kelly, if you're still having a hard time, why don't you see me after lab today, and we can talk about that, okay? And maybe I can help you out, or I can show you how to get help from Beyond Lab Z, and i uh, Heather, who does that, is very helpful, and I can email her if she doesn't help you out. All right, and this shows you how to do everything, which we're not going to do. Here's the calorimeter they talk about, and they're using sucrose. By the way, sucrose, you know, is table sugar, which has a lot of calories. And notice they have ignite and stop and all that. You look for a temperature difference, and for whatever reason, Instead of doing calories, they're doing delta H, which is enthalpy, and that's part of thermodynamics. We're doing real life stuff because Dr. White lives in the real world. All right, today's lab, which you're going to do, which you download my lab which is the only one you have to do. You don't have to do anything in the Lab Z PDF. I'll say that again slower. You do not have to do anything in the Beyond Lab Z PDF file. It was just there to show you what, if I hadn't written my own lab, what you would do. And I got to do this. Hold on one second. I'm turning off proofing so you won't see little squiggly lines for formulas and red lines. Now, interesting story. Do I have to? Oh, I have plenty of time. We don't have to. I don't have to let you go till 10 to 12. We'll get out a lot earlier than that. But first time I taught this lab was actually not at COD, but actually at ECC, Elgin Community College. And 
about time I was going to teach it, or maybe it was more than the first time. Well, the first time when I taught it, you would be surprised the flame that comes from when you burn a peanut. And I'll show you that in a second, not real life, but on a video. But after I think the third year or fourth year, in the news, there was a whole big thing about students and peanut allergies and nut allergies, which is quite serious. About a week or so before we we're gonna do this lab for all the Chem uh, 1211 equivalent classes, I thought about it and I talked to the other faculty, emailed them, what if you have students who have peanut allergies? This isn't gonna go, because you can smell peanut nuts in the air because when you burn it, there's, there's smoke. And everybody said, oh, let's use cashews. No, that's still not. So we shifted to corn chips. And that's what they use there. And I think at COD too. And you'd be surprised how well a corn chip burns. There's a huge flame come out of when you set it on fire. So be careful if you're eating corn chips or peanuts and you're near a fireplace. No, it's not gonna happen. All right. Let's look at today's lab. Everybody see introduction on your screen? Thumbs up, people. Thank you. All right. Again, heat is a measure of energy, and one heat scale is calories. And you know different foods have different amounts of calories. Today's lab, you'll be measuring the calories in a nut. And this is done by measuring the heat given off when certain chemicals, which in the nut are the fats and oils, and by the way, Dr. White's worked in the chemical industry with fats and oils, uh, beef fat, uh, pig's fat, and also vegetable oils. And, but in a nut, those burn with react with oxygen. And when they burn, this reaction gives off heat in a form of a flame. And what you'll be doing is the flame will heat a certain amount of water the difference in the starting temperature of that water and the final temperature of that water, which you measure with a thermometer, is called delta T. Delta in science, especially chemistry, means difference. And this is a capital delta from the Greek alphabet. And delta T is the difference. And using that in a formula, you can calculate how many calories are in a nut. All right, and this is called calorimetry, and the calorimeter can be very expensive. The one you saw in the Beyond Lab Z Lab costs thousands of dollars, some of them even tens of thousands. And guess what? You're never going to see that in an undergraduate lab, or rarely even a graduate lab. And we're going to use a much cheaper one, I shouldn't say cheaper, less expensive, a pop can. And when we do this lab, Students are asked to bring in pop cans, empty and clean. <laughs> now, the difference in the starting material, uh, the starting temperature, starting, starting temperature and final temperature of the water, delta T. And along with the heat capacity of water, how much energy it takes to heat a gram of water, one degree, that's the heat capacity will allow you to keep, calculate the calories in a nut. Now, I'm going to show you a YouTube video. Hang in there. And you can go back and watch this at your leisure if you'd like to also. All right, everybody see YouTube on your screen? Thumbs up, people. Thank you. Let's go full screen. I'm going to be conducting the calorimetry lab with a peanut. The first thing you need to do is read through your lab and then make sure that your setup looks like mine does here. Make sure also that your um, stick for the food source is measured out as being only three centimeters away That's from important. the base of your can. So make sure to measure that. You're going to need 100 milliliters of water that you will pour into your can. We the use water 200. temperature is what you will be recording 
initially and then after the food source has burned. Go ahead and place a thermometer into the can and let the thermometer adjust to the temperature. While it adjusts, I'm going to take the mass of my food source, which is a peanut. The mass of my peanut is 0.5 grams. You need to record that into your data table. The temperature of the water in my can is 24 degrees Celsius. Very carefully place your food source onto the pin. We use a paper clip, it's easier to use than this. And then you need to start your food source on fire. We use I'm a going gas to use lighter. A to do this because it does take some time to start the food source burning. She doesn't know how to do this because look, very careful the with flame matches. should be a little lower because the very top of the flame is the hottest part and she's not doing that, which Once is why she's having trouble getting fire and is burning. I will go ahead and place it under the can we with the water. Start in it, it right so under the, the can. Change can be recorded. You'll start to hear some little um, look at the flame on that kind of clicking when it starts to burn. That is a little uh, indication to you, um, like kind of popping that the food source is on fire on its own. You're look going at the to let flame it burn underneath and that. Up the water. Now that the peanut is completely burnt, you're going to check your ending temperature on your thermometer. For the data for the peanut, you're going to record a temperature of 33.5 degrees Celsius. You will be conducting this lab with three other food sources. No, we won't. We're only going to do one. All right, let's see. I see a question. I don't know. The salt wouldn't burn, but uh, you take that. That doesn't play a role. Uh, Kelly asked about salt on the peanut. Salt itself is inorganic and it does not react with oxygen. And if you don't, well, no, it doesn't. So that wouldn't play a role in there. Good question though, very observant. All right, now pay attention. To calculate the calorie of your nut, you'll have the mass of the water in kilograms. We use 200 milliliters, which is 0 0.200 kilograms. The delta T is the difference in temperature. And you'll multiply the mass of the water times the difference in temperature times the specific heat of water, which is calories per kilogram degrees C. And what's the specific heat of water? And students ask me, where do I find that? Well, it's right here. This number goes right there. And then you do the calculation and you'll get how many calories you had in your nut. Now, I don't know how I got the spacing wrong there. Sorry about that. And just in case you were wondering, just like you saw, you build a pop can. And the hardest part is putting the paper clips that are straightened in the can. I found a way to make it easier for me and the students by using a big nail to punch big holes in the pop can. You would add 200 milliliters, which is 0 0.200 kilograms of water to your calorimeter, the pop can. Then you'd measure the initial temperature. Then you'd add, attach the nut to the holder, which we, and we found weigh the nut and the holder together. Because sometimes after you burn the nut or corn chip, if, if you try and pick it off the holder, it just crumbles. That's called being friable. That's the chemical term and put the net and holder under your pop can, light it with a flame. We use a gas lighter like you do for your fireplace. 
And then when the burning stops, it takes about three or four minutes. It's exciting to watch, but Dr. White's a closet pyromaniac, all organic chemists who are good are. The measure the temperature of water, and then you weigh the nut residue and everything. You get rid of nut residue. We have special disposal bottle for that and put the water in the pop can, uh, dispose of the water down the sink and put the pop can in solid white, uh, you know, recycle. All right, now I'm giving you this data. The mass of the water in kilograms is 0 0.200, three significant figures. Your final temperature is this, three significant figures, but one past the decimal. And this you'll do a subtraction, which is the same as a addition rules. I guess it's the only subtraction I'll do this semester. Here's your initial temperature, your delta T, the difference is number one minus number two. Now, here's the weight of your nut and holder. Here's the weight of the uh, residue and holder. And number five, which is the weight of the nut consumed is equal to number three minus number four. Now, one of the things you'll be asked to do, and here it is, is calculate the calories in your nut. And you use formula A. Here's your delta T, here's your mass, and here's a specific heat of water. And that will give you the total calories for what was in that one nut. Now, if you look at a package, it's always so many calories per gram or whatever. And how do you do that? You take formula number six and divide it by formula number five. And then you answer these questions. And that's today's lab. And it's due next Friday. Remember, the density lab is due today. Get it in sometime today to upload it to the assignment area of Blackboard if you haven't done so yet. Uh, ooh, one thing, and I'll be sending out an email to you and everybody else in the other section. When you use Blackboard, if you've taught a course, course before, and I did 12, 11, like last semester, you can copy a lot of the things to the next course, like this one. And one of the things you copy, which makes your life easier, is the grade book. Except last semester, labs were 11 points because I only did 13. Max, here we're doing 14 because it's a little longer semester. And I changed it to 10. Well, in the parts where I actually put the scores, in the grade book, I forgot to change that from 11 to 10, and I'll do that this weekend. It's a lot of work. It's 15, uh, 14 labs. I got to go and click, 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 type in 10, do the next one. It takes a while, especially for two sections. So that's today's lab, and now it's time for an exciting experiment with Dr. White. What? This is going to be a social experiment. Wait, this is chemistry. Now it's going to be a social experiment. All right. One of the problems being online, I think I mentioned earlier today, is you just don't get a chance to meet your colleagues or Dr. White. And something I experimented with earlier in the week, and we actually did it yesterday, and it worked out pretty good, is breakout rooms. What I'm going to be doing in a little while is assigning you, and you go to a breakout room. And the breakout room, there'll be about, depending how many people showed up, well, just about uh, six of your colleagues. I'm going to have four breakout rooms. One will have five because, well, uh, wait, we have 23. What am I saying? One will have five. I forgot someone dropped at the beginning of semester. I usually think of 24. So we got a full house. Look out. 
And what we'll, I ask you to do is when you get in a breakout room, turn on your mics. If you have a camera, turn that on too and introduce yourselves to your colleagues. You can say as much or little as you want. Maybe tell people what your major, you know, if you're in a lab or a classroom after the class or after the lab, and you had a couple of you standing around, what would you do? You'd say, hello, I hope so you would, and you'd talk to each other. And this is a chance for you to get to meet other people. And coming weeks, I'll shuffle the people so you get a chance to meet everybody. And I'm gonna set up the breakout rooms. Now, listen carefully. After about 15 minutes, I'm gonna ask you all come back to the lecture. I'll end the breakout rooms. And then I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions using polling. So let me create the breakout rooms. Hang on. One of these days, I'll figure out if I can do this ahead of time. All right. <laughs> oh, come on. Why didn't just hold on? All right, now I got it. All right, could you all answer these questions, please? It's anonymous. All right, everybody answered. Let me show, share the results. Have you noticed this, everybody liked doing it and one person wasn't that interested and that's your right about doing it later on. But I think on a later date, we'll do it. We're not gonna do it every weekend. Well, maybe, we'll see. May do it a couple of times and then you can uh, form uh, friendships with the people you meet, who you want to. Uh, one of the things happened last semester and yesterday some of the students were talking about it is, what is it, Snapchat on your cell phone? You can set up groups. I know last semester, I think that's the app. But anyways, that's up to you. It's nothing I'm gonna, but one of the nice things is I got to talk to a lot of you and get to meet you, which I enjoyed. Thank you for, doing that and talking to me. All right, if I look at the clock, I'm gonna surprise you. I'm done, we're done. Remember, the lab you're doing, the calorie of a nut is due next Friday. Today, make sure you've handed in, uploaded the density lab. And with that, I'll remind you, we do have class on Monday. Don't forget, do problem set for chapter four, Ooh, my finger's broken, there, chapter four. And I'll also do my world famous review for the next test. In this case, it's test number one on Monday. And with that, gang gesund, have a great weekend, stay warm and look out for the snow that's coming our way. Make sure you go to the supermarket and get all your supplies to hunker down. And I'll see you on Monday. Gang is on. Goodbye. And I'll stick around. Anybody has questions.